welcome friends and family to the funeral services for Ida Arlene Yorkman Ward. Monday, March 13th, 2023 at 12 p.m. at the Hiram LDS North Stake Center. I'm Bishop Sheldon Browning and with me on the stand is uh, President Christian Iverson of the North Stake uh, presiding. Thank you to Lauren Ward, a son, for offering a family prayer prior to this meeting. I'd like to recognize the pallbearers, Lauren Spencer Ward, Nolan Spencer Ward, Brian Spencer Ward, Bob Durchie, Brig Nielsen, Dave Nielsen, Darren Palmer, and Daniel Smith. Compassionate services are provided by the Hiram 7th Ward Relief Society. Our prelude music is provided by our organist, Sister Jill Bland, and thank you to our chorister, Sister Julie Greer. We will open this service by singing hymn number 308, Love One Another, after which the opening prayer will be offered by Brian Ward. Our dear Father in heaven, we're grateful we can gather today as family and friends in remembrance of our mom and friend Arlene Ward. We're grateful for her life and lifelong example of faith and love and kindness and service. Help us this day to reflect on the many good memories we have with her and uh, be able to treasure those as we go forward. Uh, we're grateful for all the love and support we received from friends and neighbors and, and family. Um, please comfort those that are in need of comfort and uh, help us all to feel peace. Um, please be with those participating in the program today that they can have the spirit with them, that they can share their prepared messages and um, be happy with um, their messages. Um, at this time, we're especially grateful for the gospel, our Savior Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation that gives us knowledge we can be together again. And we're grateful for the, the thought, knowing that mom and dad are back together. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brian. We'll proceed with the program as follows. Obituary to be read by Kay Cook, a friend. Uh, thoughts and testimony by Hope Welch, also a friend followed by a musical number, I Wonder When He Comes Again, sung by Steve Bingham. Uh, after the musical number, uh, Ron Bjorkman, a brother, will, will speak, and I'll conclude with some remarks, and we'll go to that point. Arlene Bjorkman Ward passed away at the age of 80 on March 7th, 
2023. Arlene was born on a spring day, May 12, 1942, to Lila Condi and Arnold Bjorkman in the small little farming town of Malad, Idaho. She was born with bright red hair. It would become her trademark for years to come. Arlene began taking tap and tap dancing and ballet lessons before she started school and performed on many programs throughout the years. When Arlene was six years old, she was joined at home by a new baby brother, Henry Ronald Bjorkman. At age 13, Arlene went to a church dance with Spencer Ward, who was 14 at the time. They liked each other right from the start. In the song, May I Have This Dance for the Rest of My Life, became their theme song. They were married nine years later in the Logan, Utah Temple, just one week after Arlene's graduation from BYU in elementary education. Arlene will be remembered for her love of her family and the testimony and love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. She is survived by her children, Valerie, married to Dan Smith, Jennifer and Bob Durchie, Lauren, Shauna Brown, Michelle, Brig Nielsen, and Emily to Dave Nielsen, and Nolan to Allison Danes, Brian to Taryn Hagman, Heather to Darren Palmer, and 37 grandchildren. Wait a minute, is that right? Okay, 37 grand, great grand, no, 37 grandchildren and 17 great grandchildren. She was preceded in death by her parents and her husband, James Spencer Ward. Arlene is a wonderful example for all of us. She was kind, loving, and with her positive attitude, she was always willing to serve. And I'm very... I'm very thankful for her love and the influence in my life and all of our lives. She was a good lady. Hello, and thank you for the prayer. I appreciate that. I called Arlene on January 22nd to follow up after Spencer's passing. She asked me to speak at her funeral, which is difficult, but an honor. I feel the following poem is so appropriate regarding Arlene. How do you live your dash? The author is unknown. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted the first came her date of birth and spoke the following date with tears, but he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash, and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? What matters is how we live in love. For you never know how much time is left. That can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about you, how you spent your dash? Arlene lived her dash so well. 
We moved to Hiram in 1982. I first met her when the ward boundaries were changed from the fourth to the seventh ward. We left Hiram in 93, 11 years later. Very hard to leave a friend if I considered a sister by heart with only occasional contact because of our busy lives. Terry and I went to the MTC December 2003. Senior couples were housed in an old motel as they were demolishing the senior couple center. We heard noisy neighbors in the next room laughing loudly. And when we went out our door to go to a meeting, there were Spence and Arlene, as surprised as we were. We were neighbors for the entire MTC time. And unlike junior missionaries, we got special permission to attend the Tabernacle Choir's Christmas concert together. What a treat. The end of December, we moved back to Cache Valley, hoping to reconnect with our friends, especially Spence and Arlene. Matthew and Mark states that as children of our Heavenly Father, all men and women are spiritually brothers and sisters. I searched the internet for women in the Bible, and I found 10 women who expect, exceeded expectations. These ladies did not sit around waiting for someone else to get the job done. They feared God and lived faithfully. They did what they needed to do. Then 15 great women of the Bible, every Christian must know. It includes Mary, sister to Martha. I can see Arlene kneeling at the Seder's feet to listen and learn while I, like Martha, bustled around the house to sweep and clean. Then 20 women of the Bible who impacted their world, as did Arlene with her smile, enthusiasm, ability to make you feel loved. She was like my mother-in-law, short in stature, but arms long enough to circle all. Bible verses found about sisters on the internet. It is natural to love your sisters and brothers. With sisters, you always have special moments and special memories. Proverbs has many references to sisters with their characteristics of wisdom, kindness, respect for the Lord, pleasant ways, and peaceful paths. Sometimes sisterhood is a strong, loving relationship with someone who isn't blood-related, such as Ruth and Naomi. They were sisters by heart. Another quote I liked was, having a sister is like having a best friend you can't get rid of. You know, whatever you do, they'll still be there. President Russell M. Nelson in October 2018 said in a prophetic plea to the women of the church, save the shape the future by helping to gather scattered Israel. No one can do what a righteous woman can do or duplicate the influence of a mother. Women have a special gift to communicate the love of Heavenly Father and the Savior to others, which is a divine endowment. Women have the capacity to sense what someone needs in their very moment of need. She can reach out, comfort, teach, and strengthen them. He urged each to pray to understand their spiritual gifts, to cultivate, use, and expand them, and said, you will change the world as you do so. To me, Arlene accomplished all this and so much more. And Mark read of the importance of ordinary people who accomplish his work. To Arlene's family, take the time to write your impressions now as the thoughts come to you, as you gather together. It may be a word, a sentence, a paragraph or several pages. Thoughts dim as time passes and you need to pass your knowledge onto your families for Arlene and Spence's posterity. Your parents and grandparents, Spence and Arlene, blessed you because of their faith, where it's integrity, diligence, and great love, which they had for each other, for you, and for the Lord. I was raised in a non-religious environment. Arlene and I each had one younger brother and were born 10 days apart. And I hear in the obituary that we both take, took the tap dance at a very young age. Um, we were sisters by heart. Arlene and I were only 10 days apart in age. But my main connection to Arlene is due to our love for the gospel. We both had to study and determine for ourselves its truthfulness. I suggest each of you find out for yourselves while thinking of Arlene and Spence's example and legacy. Arlene accomplished many things in her normal, everyday, lifelong dash. 
I consider Arlene to be my sister by heart and will miss her. But anticipating more time with her, one of the times I called her after Spence passed, she said, Hope, oh, we've always been able to pick up where we left off. And to Arlene, I say, yes, we will pick up again someday. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I wonder when he comes again, will herald angels sing, will earth be clothed in drifts of white, or will the world know spring? I wonder if one star will shine far brighter than the rest. Will, will daylight stay the whole night through? Will songbirds leave their nest? I'm sure he'll call his little ones to gather round his feet. Because he said in days gone by, suffer them to come to me. I wonder when he comes again, will I be ready there to look upon his loving face and join with him in prayer? Each day I'll try to do his will and let my light so shine that others seeing me shall see for greater light divine. Then when that blessed day is here, I'll love, he'll love me and he'll say, You served me well, my little child. Come unto my arms to stay. I am Arlene's only sibling. She was six years old when I was born. Soon after Spencer passed away, Arlene called me and told me that she wanted me to speak at her funeral. She knew then that she didn't have long left to live. So I asked her, what do you want me to speak about? She said, tell about our growing up and about the gospel. Arlene and I grew up in Malad, Idaho. We had wonderful parents. They grew up during the Great Depression, and they wanted better lives for the children than they had experienced. Our dad had a great sense of humor. He was positive, and he was fun to be with. He provided well for his family, and he was generous with those who were less fortunate. Our mom was a stay-at-home mom. She tried to develop her children's talents, 
She had more success with Arlene than with me. Arlene uh, took dance lessons and piano lessons and did well with those. Our mom was also one who had great compassion for those who had emotional problems or financial problems. And she invested a lot of time in trying to bring happiness into other people's lives. The gospel, however, was not a part of our upbringing. Our parents had pioneer heritage, but their lifestyles were not consistent with the teachings of the gospel. Arlene and I were fortunate that we were in the Malad Second Ward. Many of our friends were active members of the church and there were many adults in the ward who took an interest in us. The Malad Second Ward building was within walking distance from where we lived. And this was back in the day when the school bus stopped on Tuesday afternoons at the church building so children could go to primary. Not long ago, I asked Arlene about her testimony. How did she gain her testimony? She told me that she always believed the gospel was true. She couldn't remember a time when she didn't have a testimony. She remembered that when she was young, she saw families going to church and she knew that's what she wanted. She was naturally drawn to spiritual things. When Arlene was in her teenage years, her commitment to the gospel increased. And as a result, there were conflicts between her and our parents. For example, our family would occasionally go on a Sunday outing to Lava Hot Springs, but she would stay home and attend church. Our mom did, want, did not want her to attend midweek uh, youth meetings at church. So an adult leader arranged for meetings at her home at times when Arlene could participate. When Arlene was in high school, our mom wanted her to take a home ec or some other useful class as opposed to seminary, but uh, Arlene took seminary. From as early as I can remember, our parents wanted us to receive a university education. They had in mind that we would go to Utah State University. When Arlene decided that she wanted to go to BYU instead of Utah State, that was a huge conflict. Now, I recognize that I'm in Utah State country here, and many of you would side with my parents on this issue. But uh, in any event, Arlene went to BYU and received her degree from BYU. <clears throat> Arlene was a great example and mentor for me. She had a way of persuading me to do the right thing, even when I wasn't self-motivated. Uh, for example, she encouraged me to pray every night before I went to sleep. When she discovered that I was just sitting up in bed to pray and I wasn't kneeling to pray, she said, Ron, what if the only thing that kept you out of heaven was that you didn't kneel when you said your prayers at night? That gives you some idea of my childhood. <laughs> well, I ran that question through my little boy decision tree, and I did begin to kneel every night when I prayed. When I was 11 years old, Arlene told me that I would soon be having an interview with a bishop about becoming a deacon, and I'd better mend my ways and be prepared for that interview. Well, I did repent, and I did receive the Aaronic Priesthood, and that was the beginning of my activity in the church. I'm grateful for Arlene's courage and determination in her commitment to live the gospel. She was a trailblazer in our family and certainly eased the way for me. As an aside, I would say to all who care about youth, never give up on children and youth or in families who are not yet active. Some will respond. Arlene told me that one of the things that was important for her when she attended church alone was that many adults would tell her how happy they were to see her there. Arlene and Spencer began dating when they were teenagers. From a little brother's perspective, I was able to see that romance blossom. After Arlene and Spencer were married, Spencer was more like a brother to me than a brother-in-law. 
and he ordained me to the office of elder before I served the mission. After Marilyn and I were married, Spencer and Arlene were role models for us. Lean years did not prevent them from beginning a large family. And regardless of other time demands, they always accepted church callings and served others. After we both left home, Arlene and I didn't live near each other, so we would talk occasionally on the telephone or maybe see each other occasionally. And when we talked, we talked about the gospel, and we talked about our families. Spencer and Arlene have five daughters and three sons. Marilyn and I have five sons and three daughters. To say that our parents were surprised with the size of their posterity would be an understatement. When Arlene and I talked about our background, we both recognized that we benefited from obtaining our testimonies independent of our parents. Also, our desire to see our parents become active in the church deepened our love and our concern for them. Because of our experiences, we both had concern for those not yet active in the church, and we knew that people could change. Because of how we gained our testimonies, Arlene and I were maybe a little bit more assertive as we taught the gospel to our own children than we might have been had the gospel come easy for us. As to our upbringing, the rest of the story is that after Arlene and I were both married, our parents were sealed in the Logan Temple, and Arlene and I were sealed to them. Just a few days ago, Marilyn and I visited Arlene when she was staying with Brian and Taryn and receiving hospice care. We talked openly with her about the end of her earthly life coming soon. We asked Arlene about her happiest memories. She was quick to answer that being with Spencer, raising her children, and the times when she made the right decision were her happy memories. One of those decisions she told us about was that after Spence and Arlene started their family, she had an opportunity to teach in Logan. She said she then had an impression where she saw herself standing in their kitchen with other members of the family swirling around her, but she was the anchor of the family. She knew that would not happen if she accepted that position. So she turned it down. She focused on her family and became that anchor in her family. Arlene relied on Jesus Christ as her savior. She knew as stated multiple times in the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the only name given whereby we can gain salvation. She understood that none of us can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ or the doctrine of Christ is the narrow way which leads unto life. And Arlene wanted all of her family and those she cared about to be on this narrow path because every other way is part of the broad way that leads to destruction. I believe Arlene experienced what President Russell M. Nelson taught in the last general conference. He said, living the doctrine of Christ can produce the most powerful virtual cycle, virtu most powerful virtuous cycle, creating spiritual momentum in our lives. As we strive to live the higher laws of Jesus Christ, our hearts, and our very natures begin to change. The Savior lifts us above the pull of this fallen world by blessing us with greater charity, humility, generosity, kindness, self-discipline, peace, and rest." Close quote. President Nelson also taught the importance of trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. 
And I think it's worthwhile to take just a few minutes to talk about some of these philosophies of men because we all need to guard against them so that we're not diverted from the narrow path that leads to eternal life. As the father of lies, Satan has a wide range of false philosophies, some of which conflict with each other, but all of which deny the doctrine of Christ. The teachings of the three primary antichrists in the Book of Mormon, Sherem, Nehor, and Korahor, are examples of false philosophies that are taught today and that are dangerous philosophies today. Sherem taught that there should be no Christ. Like many teachers of falsehoods today, Sherem was learned and had a perfect knowledge of the language of the people. And he used flattery and powerful speech according to the power of the devil. Sherem accused the prophet Jacob of leading the people away from the law of Moses by teaching the doctrine of Christ. Essentially, Sherem's false philosophy was that Jesus Christ is unnecessary and simply living a good life suffices. Nehor was the second antichrist and his teachings are per perhaps more enticing than Sherem's. Nehor taught that all mankind would be saved at the last day for the Lord had created all men and had also redeemed all men, and in the end, all men should have eternal life. For Nehor and his followers, repentance was unnecessary. A philosophy which makes no demands is tempting, and many today rely on a God who makes no demands, who makes no judgments, and who imposes no punishment for unrepented sin. Korahor was the third antichrist, like Sherem, Korahor also taught that there would be no Christ. Korahor railed against believers, saying that they were bound down under a foolish and a vain hope, and that prophecies were foolish traditions. Korahor taught that you cannot know of things which you do not see, therefore you cannot know that there shall be a Christ. He also taught that whatsoever a man did was no crime, that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof, that God does not exist, and that the doctrine of Christ is oppressive. Today, many loud voices proclaim that there is no God, that those who believe in God are foolish, that commandments are part of a foolish and oppressive tradition, and that one can only know what he or she can determine with the physical senses. How do we know? But what Sherem, Nehor, and Korahor taught were lies. Well, for one thing, each of them, as they came to a bad end, acknowledged that what they taught was false. These are the last words of Sherem. I fear lest I have committed the unpardonable sin, for I have lied unto God, for I denied the Christ. And I said that I believed the scriptures, and they truly testify of him. Nehor, shortly before his death, Knowledge that what he had taught to the people was contrary to the word of God. And Korahor not only acknowledged the falsity of his teachings, but also identified their source. He wrote, the devil deceived me, for he appeared unto me and said unto me, there is no God, and taught me that which I should say. And I have taught his words, and I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind, insomuch that I believe that what insomuch that I believed that they were true and I withstood the truth. Contrary to what the Antichrist taught, Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And the narrow way is a happy and not an oppressive path. Consider these truths taught by President Nelson last October. Making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Because Jesus Christ overcame this fallen world, and because he atoned for each of us, 
we can overcome this sin-saturated, self-centered, and often exhausting world, close quote. Our first step in embracing the doctrine of Christ is to exercise faith in Jesus Christ unto repentance. For some, repentance seems like a negative doctrine, but repentance is a wonderful gift made possible by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Elder D. Todd Christopherson said this about repentance. When the Savior began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it was the message of love. When Pro Elder Christopherson continued, when prophets come crying repentance, it throws cold water on the party. But in reality, the prophetic call should be received with joy. Without repentance, there is no real progress or improvement in life. Pretending there is no sin does not lessen its burden and pain. Suffering for sin does not by itself change anything for the better. Only repentance gives us access to the atoning grace of Jesus Christ and salvation. The gift of repentance is the cause for true celebration. In the plan of happiness, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost follow faith and repentance. For the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then comes a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Elder David, R. Bednar, David A. Bednar taught the importance of ordinances as follows. The ordinances of salvation and exaltation administered in the Lord's restored church are far more than rituals or symbolic performances. Rather, they constitute authorized channels through which the blessings and powers of heaven can flow into our individual lives. After we have entered the straight and narrow path through baptism and have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, we are to press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end in order to have eternal life. We need personal revelation to navigate the way to eternal life successfully. And we are promised that after we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it is the Holy Ghost that will show us all things that we should do. This is personal revelation. And in these perilous times, President Nelson has urged us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive such personal revelation. Finally, being true to the doctrine of Christ is a lifelong process. President Nelson explained overcoming the world is not an event that happens in a day or two. It happens over a lifetime as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. For Marilyn and me, our visit with Spencer and Arlene shortly before Spencer's passing and our visit with Arlene shortly before her passing were sacred times. When we last visited with Spencer and Arlene, Spencer did not have long left. He was ready to begin service on the other side of the veil. He hoped he would be able to do missionary work there, but he didn't want to leave Arlene. But Arlene told him, don't worry, I will be there soon. It's okay to leave. When we visited Arlene a few days ago, she knew the end of her life was imminent. She did not fear death. She looked forward to it as a release from a weak and a failing body. She looked forward to it as an entryway to a reunion with Spencer and other loved ones. Spencer talked about being a missionary on the other side of the veil. Arlene wondered if there might be a need for a nursery leader there. If people are most honest about their beliefs when they know that death is near, and I think they are, then Spencer and Arlene demonstrated complete faith and sincere faith in Jesus Christ as they faced death. As I think about Arlene and the many lives that she has influenced, and that would be many of you who are here today, she would not be focused on what 
she has done for others, but she would say, thank you for what you have done for me and for my family. My testimony is that Jesus Christ is the only name given whereby we can gain salvation and that the doctrine of Christ is truly the plan of eternal happiness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you to all those who have participated in today's services and also to all those who worked and prepared to make these services possible. We are gathered today to celebrate the life and mourn the passing of Arlene Ward. On such an occasion, we are afforded the blessing to share memories as Arlene's friends, Kay and Hope have done to offer support and comfort as Arlene's brother, Ron, has done, and to reflect on the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In only three weeks on Easter Sunday, we'll celebrate Christ's resurrection. In the sp spirit world, the knowledge of Christ's atonement and resurrection is not veiled like it is for us still embodied. The added clarity in the spirit world, I like to think, must amount to Easter celebrations even more momentous. And perhaps those celebrations are commencing already. Those of us with knowledge and testimony of the restored gospel, are reassured by, by each principle in it including, most importantly, that Jesus Christ has broke the bands of death, we are assured of the continuance of our spirits. As Arlene joins her eternal companion, Spencer, after just over two months of separation from each other, it is comforting, even joyful, to contemplate what must be the happiest of circumstances in the spirit world. How fortunate is our situation in its distinction from that of Jesus's friends and disciples, who at his recent passing hadn't yet comprehended his teachings about his atonement and resurrection. Sister Reina Alberto, second counselor in the LDS Relief Society General Presidency said, we can imagine how they felt upon witnessing his death. On the day of the crucifixion, not knowing what would happen on Sunday, they must have been overwhelmed by distress, wondering how they would go on without their Lord. It is natural, even good, to mourn the passing of a beloved mother, grandmother, and friend. Arlene Ward was all of these. Sister Alberto pointed out that Christ would have allowed the same for Mary Magdalene to grieve and to express her pain. Such is evidenced by his question to her, woman, why are you crying? With the knowledge we have, we have from the accounts in the New Testament, in the Book of Mormon, and through the scriptures of the restored gospel, we have the blessed distinction to be allowed to both mourn and to celebrate the milestone that Arlene, through death, has undertaken. One of those fu fundamental tenets of our faith is that families can be together forever. Through Christ's atonement, death is a passageway rather than an end. Arlene has stepped through the threshold to greet loved ones. Through the sealing power of the temple, you members of the Spencer and Arlene Ward family, immediate and extended, may look to the day of reunions more celebratory even than those you've had on this earth. And I know you have had great times together. I've seen some of those moments captured in photos as I watched the slideshow playing in the foyer. These are made poignant as I match the faces and photos with you in real life as you pass through the hallway and as I see you interact with each other. 
from backyard gatherings, birthday festivities, weddings, travels, Easter's and Christmases, and many other happy occasions. It's clear that there is a tight bond between each member of this well-parented family. And as good, as memorable, as cheerful as those times have been, the eternal nature of God's plan and of human progression suggests that such family occasions that take place beyond the confines of this world are and will be even more meaningful. I've loved getting to know the next generations of the Ward family, even if mostly observational. Your happy demeanors and countenances at such occasions as the passing of your parents and grandparents is a testament both to the testimonies and teachings of your parents, as well as to the development of your own spiritual foundations, including the meaning of death in God's plan of happiness and salvation. Arlene and Spencer's relationship was built to a large, large extent on dancing. A shared love and favorite activity during their courtship, which started for Arlene at age 13. Later, the demands of professional duties, the responsibilities of nurturing a large family, and callings in the church to which they both were devoted, no doubt led to, to diminished opportunity with each passing year to dance as they once had. And with bodies inflicted with disease and age near the, near the end of their lives, the shared joy they found in dancing together was mostly a fond memory from their distant past. And so I love to picture Arlene and Spencer freed from mortal limitations, sharing a kind of dance as exhilarating as they found it to be in their youth, as made possible by the resurrection of our savior, Jesus Christ. Their dancing and their relationship will only continue to be enhanced with reunion of their spirits to their immortalized bodies. It is my testimony that God, the father of our spirits established the plan of happiness, which makes such a joyful reunion a reality for Arlene and Spencer Ward, and eventually in a comparable way for each and all of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'll close this service by singing hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art, after which the closing prayer will be given by Nolan Spencer Ward. The interment will take place at the Hiram Cemetery, and the dedication of the grave will be given by Lauren Ward.
Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity we've had to share some time together to remember our mother and friend. We're grateful for the words of comfort that have been spoken and the things that we've been able to reflect upon and remember. We're grateful for those who have come and to celebrate the life of our mother have traveled some uh, long distances to show their respect and to give comfort. We're grateful for the love that's been extended to our family at this time. And we know that the source of that love comes from thee and we're grateful for it. We ask that as we close this meeting, we may Hold in our hearts, dear, uh, the memory of our mother and friend. We're so grateful for our uncle Ron and his words today. And how he reminds us of our mother in so many ways. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.